Well, a large two-engine train was making its way across the country, the continental United States, and as they were crossing across the western mountains, one of the engines of the train broke down. The engineer didn't feel like it was too big a deal, though. They had another engine. They could obviously get there with the other engine. They, he's, he thought, no problem. We can make it to Denver and get a replacement engine. We'll, we'll make it through this trip. The train carried on about half power and not too much farther along, and I guess you probably would know this by now in the story, that the other engine broke down. So they came to a standstill in the middle of nowhere. And the engineer hadn't seen any buildings for miles except for an old monastery. Well, that's, that's the wrong story. That's the wrong story. <laughs> I thought you might want to hear that story again, so. <laughs> anyway, with the train broken down, the, the engineer had to inform the people, the passengers, about why the train had stopped. And he was always trying to, to look at the brighter side of things, so he, he made this announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, I have some good news and some bad news for you. The bad news is that both engines on the train have failed, and we will be stuck here for a few hours until a working engine um, gets to where we are. The good news is that you didn't take this trip in a plane. <laughs> now, a few weeks ago, we entered into the season of Lent, we're, and we're well on our way to Good Friday and Easter, and and Lent is a time where we get an opportunity to reflect on the cross and all that Jesus has done for us, uh, the bad news and the good news. Really good news for us, but, you know, not such great news for Jesus. He had to go through some pretty rough things to get, to get us to where we need to be. Definitely good news for us, though. Amen? Now, would you turn with me to Mark chapter 8? If you've been following along with any of the Lent reading lists, Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38 is is on that list, one that you would have encountered along the way. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38, it says, He, being Jesus, then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about these things, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my, my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of God, the Son of Man, will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with holy angels. Kind of an interesting passage, one that we've probably all read before. Jesus is sharing that he, he, he's going to suffer many things, He's going to be rejected by the religious leaders, that he's going to be killed, and then he's going to rise again. And the Bible tells us that he spoke very plainly about this. He spoke very clearly. He wasn't trying to hide anything. He was trying to be very clear about what was about to happen. And then we see Peter disagreeing with where this is all going, disagreeing with this idea that Jesus is going to suffer and be rejected and die. He takes Jesus aside in a very private conversation and he begins rebuking Jesus. If you can imagine rebuking Jesus, that would be interesting. But Jesus wasn't going to have any of that. He, he turned back to the rest of the disciples. You notice that? So that everyone could hear. And then Jesus starts doing the rebuking. <laughs> he tells Peter, Peter to get behind me, Satan. That would be a hard thing to hear. You do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. Does that sound familiar from last week? He doesn't want us to be merely humans. He has higher expectations of us than that. These words that Jesus say, they, they should obviously have some special meaning to us. We've been talking about believing the good news. We've been talking about worshiping Jesus. We've been talking about being a follower of Jesus. And 
can we follow Jesus if we're in front of him? No. We have to get behind him and do what he does. And that's what he's telling Peter here. We have to have him in mind. We've, he's got to be in front of us if we're following him, right? We have to have his concerns in mind, his thoughts in mind. We can't just go with our own intuition. We've got to ask him what he's interested in if we're going to follow him. And I think we can gain some insight into what his concerns are with what he talks about next. Verse 34, he says, Then he called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my, my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now that doesn't sound like something that we probably would want to do, following Jesus, picking up a cross. And that's not something that would be on my top of my priority list, taking up a cross. But I still think the emphasis here from Jesus is following him, doing what he does, uh, thinking about the things that he does. And he's not done with this conversation. He adds another piece to the puzzle in verse five, 35. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Do you see what he added in there? What's Jesus' concern? The gospel. The good news. What is the good news? Well, it's that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he was resurrected from the dead, that he lives today so that we can have that hope to live as well. And again, this certainly doesn't sound like very good news to Jesus, what he's about to encounter, but, but it's all we have. This is our hope, our only hope. And this is what Jesus is telling his disciples in verse 31 when, when Peter has a problem with it. Jesus said he would suffer, he'd be rejected, he would, he would die on the cross, and Peter has a problem with this game plan. He didn't want Jesus to be rejected. He didn't want Jesus to be killed. Now, if you've heard a sermon on this particular passage, I think the next logical move here is to talk about Peter and the Jews and their misconception of the Messiah, what the Messiah was going to be like. The Messiah was supposed to be powerful. He was supposed to overpower the enemies of Israel. He was supposed to, to help them. He wasn't supposed to die. He wasn't supposed to suffer. The disciples had a problem with Jesus suffering, with Jesus dying. The disciples had a problem with this somehow weak-looking Messiah that, that he would suffer and die. Now, what's interesting about this passage, in truth be told, we see what the disciples are struggling with, this thought process of this version of the Messiah, but that really isn't our problem. We've heard this story over and over again since we were kids. We know about Jesus suffering and dying. We know this version of the story. We're not surprised by this. We're not surprised like the disciples would have been. I mean, it's okay for Jesus to be rejected and die. We know the rest of the story, right? We know that he rises again. We, we know that he's still alive. We're okay with this. But there is a part of this story that we do struggle with, I think. There's a part that this, the church struggles with, and and I think we struggle, much like the religious leaders in Jesus' time, with Jesus dying, not for the righteous, but for the sinners. I think this is part, the part of the story that, that we trip up on. You see, I don't think we always see ourselves as sinners anymore. We make, uh, we, we have entered into this relationship with Jesus. We've worked hard to put our lives together. We've made good choices. We've, we've, he's transformed our lives. We've worked hard to be right in the eyes of the Lord. We are so far past that. We, we sometimes struggle even seeing who we once were. Don't get me wrong. We know that Jesus has saved us and we're thankful for that, but I think we often forget what kind of mess we were in before we met Jesus. We don't always connect those out there outside of this area as being in the same boat that we were when we found Jesus. We've lived long enough with Christ that we've forgotten what we once were. That we were just like them. And if we're not careful, we, we, create, we create this distinction between those who are righteous and those who are sinners. Between us and them. 
And you know who the them are, right? Those sinners. We can fall into the same trap that the religious leaders fell into in Jesus' time. So let's continue in this conversation. Turn with me to Mark chapter 2. Now remember, if we are going to follow Jesus, we have to be concerned about the things that Jesus is concerned about. The, the, be concerned about his thought processes and what he's thinking. And Think about what the scriptures tell us about Jesus. Okay? So we, as we're working through this, think about Jesus and what he's thinking. Mark 2, beginning with verse 13, another story that we find. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Doesn't he know better than that? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Have you ever noticed that Jesus is always getting in himself in trouble because of who he was hanging out with? I mean, he was always hanging out with those sinners. He was always eating with those sinners. Have you noticed that? And really, this verse 17, it's always interesting to me. How do you read this? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. So let me ask you, do you take this to mean that the healthy are good to go? That they don't need Jesus? Is Jesus saying, they don't need me, they're already righteous. It's really just the sinners who need my help. They're the ones who are sick. I mean, who is really in trouble here? Do you consider yourself one of the healthy ones, the righteous ones, the ones who don't need Jesus? Well, be careful how you answer that. The church has really struggled with this dis distinction between righteous and sinners for years. Why? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to we like to hang out with our own kind. We like to hang out with people who, who we're like. We really don't like to hang out with people with problems. Of course, we don't count our problems into that. <laughs> they don't know the rules, do they? They have bad habits. They don't know that they're sitting in my spot. I mean, w what if they start influencing my kids? I mean, have you smelled them? They're stinky. I mean, they come up with all sorts of uh, excuses, don't we? It's just best if they live separate from us. I'm, there, I'm sure there's some church in town that would, that would accept them, that would bring them in, some place where they would better fit than our place. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. So which one are you? Are you the righteous or the sinner? Are you needy? Do you need Jesus? Are you desperately needing Jesus? Have we lost our desperation for Jesus? Do you realize that one of the main reasons that Jesus was rejected by the re religious leaders was because of who he hung out with? I mean, just look at his disciples. They didn't deserve to be taught by a rabbi. Fishermen, tax collectors. If Jesus was walking on earth today, who do you think you'd hang out with? Do you hang out with the people that he would hang out with? Something to think about. Would you turn with me to Matthew 15? One more passage to look at this morning. Matthew 15. You know, Matthew is considered the gospel for the Jews. And we, we find a story in Matthew 15 that really helps us see what Jesus is about, what we're interested in. It really takes the cake. Matthew 15, beginning with verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. 
A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter's demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus didn't answer a word. So his disciples came to him, urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, very odd answer, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. You have great faith. Your request is granted, and her daughter was healed at that moment. Another interesting passage. Here Jesus is taking his disciples out of town. I mean, it's very interesting for Jews. Jews have all these clean laws, right? There's a lot of things they can't do that will make because they'll become ceremonially unclean if they do them. So they avoid non-kosher places and things and people. And here Jesus takes them at least a day's journey, probably two days' journey out of town, away from everything that they would know that was Jewish. They've left the boundaries of Judea. They enter into the land of the Gentiles, the non-Jews, the pagans. These were people who hadn't read the Hebrew scriptures, hadn't ever went to a Hebrew worship service. They weren't worshiping the Hebrew God. So why was Jesus going there? Why would Jesus hang out, with those, hang out with those kind of people? Why would he do it? Well, needless to say, as you might expect, they're out in the middle of nowhere. They're in places that you wouldn't encounter anything but Gentiles. And no sooner had they entered into this Gentile territory, this Gentile woman, a Canaanite, she comes and just barges right into their business. Can you believe that woman? She doesn't know the rules. She's crying out to Jesus for help. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter, she's suffering terribly. She needs your help. She's desperate for Jesus. And Jesus, oddly enough, doesn't answer her. She, she keeps yelling. She's not going to give up. His disciples, probably tired of the noise, because wouldn't we be tired of the noise? Someone yelling, what are you doing? Jesus, can't you get rid of this lady? Now, in defense of the disciples, they were, they were in the middle of a meeting. Every time they would get together for a meal, you see this over and over in Scripture, you see it with the Jews. That's, they eat and eat and eat, and every occasion they eat. Every meeting they have is over dinner. And they were probably in the middle of a, a meeting gathered around their rabbi, their teacher, Jesus. They're probably having this great theological discussion. I mean, this would have been the normal thing. And here comes this woman interrupting their discussion. Now, in those days, w women weren't allowed to even be a part of that discussion. Women were to quietly wait on the men while they sat around the table and ate was their, their culture. So this woman really had two strikes against her. First of all, she was a woman, right? But she wasn't just any woman. She was a Gentile woman, someone who was a godless pagan, someone that the Hebrews would have thought was an idolater. In fact, Jesus often called, Jews actually often called Gentiles dogs, she was not welcome at the table. I mean, she was probably the lowest class of the lowest class. And surprisingly enough, we see Jesus actually alluding to this dog name, this Gentile name. He replied, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. What's he doing? A little pop quiz for the disciples? Take them on a little road trip out into the middle of nowhere with all these lost people around? What's he doing? Trying to get them to think. 
And this woman, she takes the bait, doesn't she? She's, she's got such a great need, she's not giving up. She's desperately needing Jesus' help. She wasn't going to take no for an answer. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's plate, from the master's table. And what Jesus says next would have shocked, maybe even angered his disciples. Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. What? A Gentile dog, a woman has great faith? Matthew only records Jesus saying this to two people in his gospel, that you have great faith. And he saves this one. The first time he says it, to, the, to a Gentile woman. You have great faith, is what he said. Now, can you imagine what the disciples must have been thinking when they hear Jesus say this? I mean, they have left everything for him. They've been wandering around the countryside with him, doing whatever and anything that he would want them to do, and they've never praised, he's never praised them that way, that they have great faith. He saves it for a Gentile woman. In fact, Jesus has been teaching. He's performing miracles. He's casting out demons. They've seen Jesus at work. But somehow, they don't quite get who he is. And here this woman comes along who knows hardly anything about him and believes in him. She has great faith. And what kind of faith could she possibly have? She doesn't know the scriptures. She's never been to a Jewish worship service. She doesn't know really anything about the law, how could she follow it? She hadn't prayed the prayer. She probably hadn't heard Jesus preach. She probably hadn't recited any of the creeds. Yet Jesus says to her, you have huge faith. You have gigantic faith. You have great faith. Jesus welcomes her to the table. Now what could possibly warrant such a statement from Jesus. Could it be her need for Jesus? Could it be that she's recognized that she desperately needs Jesus? Now, when you think of righteousness before God, do you think about something that you earn? Or do you think about it as a gift? Are you in need of a doctor? Are you in desperate need for a doctor? Are you okay the way you are? Did Jesus come for you? Are you okay with Jesus hanging out with and pursuing sinners? Are you willing to follow him there? This story emphasizes the scandalous nature of Jesus' ministry. Jesus was not crucified because he saved people. All people expect a Savior to save people. That's not unusual. Jesus was crucified because he saved the wrong people. The wrong people. He saved people who nobody thought could be saved. He saved people that nobody wanted to save. And he was hated for it. Now, maybe there's some implications in here for us. I mean, if we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to worship Jesus, if we're going to go be with Jesus, if if we're going to be his people, aren't we going to have to hang out with the people that Jesus hangs out with? That Jesus is pursuing, that Jesus is, is, is calling And sometimes that can be a greater challenge than spending time with Jesus, hanging out with people that Jesus hangs out with. I mean, I have to hang out with you guys. Think about it. In Jesus' church, the church that Jesus is in charge of, that casts a vision for, there's there's no entrance exams to, to weed out the people that we don't like. We don't get to have this admissions office to make sure that people who who enter into here think like us who look like us. We have to put up with anybody our Lord drags into this place. Think about that. 
It's not always easy, is it? And it's one thing to be with Jesus and welcome him in, into your heart. It's another thing to welcome those who he welcomes. One of the first verses I memorized as a kid was John 3.16. It says this, For God so loved the church that he gave his one and only son for people who look a lot like me and my friends. Isn't that how it goes? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes... Whosoever, that includes a lot of people, doesn't it? Lots of different kinds of people. Whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Think about that. Even us. Now we're going to take communion this morning. We, we come to this table, and it stretches, really if you think about it, it stretches around the world. There's people taking communion with us around the world there's all sorts of different people at this table. It's really a table without any boundaries. The main requirement for being at this table is that you are a certifiable, <laughs> honest-to-goodness sinner. Someone in need of a doctor. Someone in need of Jesus. Not just in need of him, but desperately needing him. Any desperate people out there? And, and it really, we should enjoy when Jesus pushes the boundaries out, winning over people that really shouldn't be connected with us. They have no other reason to connect with us other than their desperate need for Jesus. Is that okay if Jesus is kind of radical that way? You know, I believe that this is kind of a test for the church to somehow worry more about who's outside the church than who's inside the church. Think about that. To somehow worry more about who's outside the church than who's inside. Could we get to that point? I mean, there's no other way to worship Jesus. There's no other way to follow Jesus without that. But I'm going to be honest with you. It's tough to be his disciples. It's hard to get this truth down into the depths of our souls that Jesus Christ came to save sinners and really he came to serve only sinners. And sometimes these sinners are people who don't know Genesis from a rock band. And sometimes these sinners are people who know the scriptures backwards and forwards. They think they, they know a thing or two about life and their knowledge is great about the Lord and they think that's the reason why they get to go to the Lord's table. Jesus even came for them. We have to be willing to welcome anyone that Jesus died for. And this, this becomes a continuing challenge and really, I think, an adventure. Are you ready for an adventure with God? What kind of crazy person is he going to bring in next week? Are we interested in being concerned about the things that Jesus is concerned about? To have our hearts break for the things that his heart breaks for? To be concerned about others finding the good news. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Are you willing to be a hospital? A hospital for Jesus and welcome, even invest in all of those Jesus drags, not just into this place, but into our lives. Better yet, are you willing to see that everyone is equal at the foot of the cross? How different are we, really? The reason why we take communion as a people, together, not individually, is because we're helping ourselves remember that we are the body of Christ. We are all the same in Christ. We are all sinners. We all have the same need for Jesus. Jesus died for us all. We have the same spirit who empowers. We have a lot of things in common. And when we take communion, we're taking it together, remembering together what Jesus has done for all of us and for all of those out there. 
So as we take communion this morning, may you remember whose you are. And maybe if you think too highly of yourselves or, or maybe if you think too lowly of yourselves or maybe you just haven't been as welcoming as you think you probably should have been to those that Jesus were welcoming. I mean, would you just spend a few moments this morning speaking to Jesus, talking to him about his crazy ways, his crazy love, even for us? Would you be willing to repent and believe the good news that Jesus died for all of us? All of us. He wants all to be saved. Would you prepare your hearts for communion this morning? As the ushers come, let's pray. Lord God, I just pray that you would just guide us in this time. We are your church. We are your people. We should be interested in the things that you're interested in. And we are so thankful that you were interested in us. That you loved us even while we were still sinners. Lord God, as we'd spend this time with you, as we remember your body broken for us, as we remember your blood spilled for us, would you, would you, Lord, make your presence known to us? Would you speak to us? Would you challenge us? Would you help us to be your people this morning? We love you. Would you stand with me as we close our service this morning? I want to close our service with a reading from Matthew chapter 5. It says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Would you pray with me? Lord God, you've called us to be a light in our community. It's not a light that we own ourselves. It's a light because your presence is in our lives. It's something that you do in and through us. Would you help us to be desperately in need of you so your presence stays with us and in us so that others might see this great light in this world? Help us to be your body this week. Help us to be your hands and feet. Help us to be the light of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. You are sent.